Hello, my name is Colin Goldberg and welcome to the um, Tech Expressionist Salon number 53. Um, tonight's salon is being moderated by um, two artists, two of our artists, uh, Renata Janiszewska and Tommy Mintz. And um, the topic this evening is photography and media confluence. Um, so uh, Renata and Tommy have uh, selected a panel of artists to um, present their work. And without further ado, I will hand it over to um, Renata. Thank you very much, Colin. I'm really looking forward to the presentations that we're going to have tonight on photography and media confluence. Uh, Tommy is um, a photographer and he gave our artists some questions to consider in doing their presentations this evening. And I believe that he can paraphrase them for us before we get started. Thank you, Renata. Um, Renata and I, I had a series of uh, uh, correspondence uh, over the past two weeks since the last um, text expressionism meeting. And um, we came up with a couple uh, prompts that we were hoping to uh, instigate a conversation based on, and um, I'm pulling them up right now. I'm having a hard time talking and tapping at the same time. So um, the ideas we um, sort of would like to introduce in this conversation are the idea that um, at the beginning of photography, uh, the painter um, Paul de la Roche uh, famously declared that um, painting uh, was dead, right? So now as photographers, as lens-based artists, where do we stand at this moment of AI? Um, uh, Susan Sontag in 1972, I hope, um, said that um, photography served as um, the sort of locus of visual uh, imagination and photography re-understood what we have the right to observe and unlike all other media has the grandiose ambition to catalog the entire world. Um, so that was about photographers working in our separate dark rooms and now the photographers work with computers that are interconnected through digital media at all times, how does that change our worldview? Um, so where are we when we work as photographers now? Um, and those are the questions that we sort of came to this over this week. Um, what new forms arise when considering this space? Um, and, and how do you find yourself as, as artists working within the space? What new forms have you found? Um, and that's, where my praise my 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 bit ends. Thanks, Renata. Um, I think you have a list of artists that um, we're going to have five minute presentations. Hopefully, yes, and yes. The, I've posted the list to the chat. Our first artist is coming to us from the Netherlands. He is Tikoy Kaitenbroer. Thank you very much for staying up late to be with us tonight. Well, uh, thank you, Renate. Thank you also for uh, the invite tonight. Um, I'm really looking forward to see all the other presentations as well. And um, now that I'm starting presentations, somebody's knocking on the door. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's probably my wife coming home. I have to open it. Sorry. Oh. So sorry for that. Oh, well, um, time differences. Um, well, to answer the big question of tonight, whether I think um, photography will die by the end of new media and AI, like um, they said paint, painting would do, I would say that's a big no for me. Um, photography has always been such a strong media and I think that's especially because of the paradox of photography that um, it's a straight reflection of reality, but at the same time, it's not because it's just a two dimensional depiction of it and it could never be real. But at the same time, it has this power that people um, say, and when they show their, their passport photo, they say, this is me. They don't say this is a photo of me, this is me. So it's always been 
such a strong um, medium for me. And to um, be able to mix it with other media, that's the big, big part and the big exciting thing about it. And I think that will, of course, never go, will never go under, especially will even get bigger in, in, in time. And well, like the first way I used photography was to, um, because I couldn't sketch or anything, I'm going to start my share screen now. I, um, okay, basic share. So, no, really. How come this is the wrong freaking? Oh, sorry. There we go. Well, mm -hmm. I couldn't <laughs> really sketch, so I took photos and then I got them developed and brought them to a bookstore and I photocopied it and I enlarged it and enlarged it. So I had a back piece to draw on or to paint on on my first <laughs> art classes in, in high school. And that was the first um, get together of different media. This is the first uh, double exposure because this is the big thing I'm doing now. The first double exposure I ever took, but it's also made with um, a pinhole camera I made myself with six holes in it and it goes um, in these six parts which intertwine in one negative. But here in the middle you can see my first <laughs> self-portrait um, double exposure. Um, I've been uh, making myself make uh, a daily ex uh, a daily double uh, for uh, a whole year now and um, this is uh, a big thing for me because I was getting almost lost in in all the opportunities and all the possibilities in uh, making the double exposures uh, and also uh, making them with glitch and and everything but now it's back to looking at the, 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 the composition and the framing and, and um, the lighting and the, 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 the most basic parts. And it's also uh, a, a small diary. And there, there are even, um, like here I'm waiting for my daughter to come out of recovery. So there are really personal stuff in there as well. And colleagues and so um, I like uh, being back to the to the base and um, considering photography to be uh, the beautiful thing that it is. Um, and as a text presentist, I um, really like uh, combining the new and the old and that can go both ways um, like making pinhole photos and stitching them together and make a quick time VR so you can turn around in a, in a in an environment that looks like it's in 1873 but it's in 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 the now um, one minute left or like the other way around um, you manipulate work on the computer and um, you put it back on a negative or you put it on a sheet and you expose it on a on a on, on a original photo paper um, pause sharing i want to get back to the yeah no stop sharing thank you very much no. Well, I wanted to show you some things as well. I'm making my own photography paper, paper, and then uh, the mm, the digital processed or manipulated works. I can put back on an on a on an old, really old medium, and I really love the way of uh, the the old. Uh, processes just say annotate with the new stuff so 
Those are cyanotypes. Sorry? Are, are those cyanotypes? Yeah, the, these are cyanotypes. And I Beautiful. also started with the uh, Tendike Brown uh, process. But there are also bigger ones that, or bigger ones. These, these are uh, ones that I, I uh, uh, got um, re, um, relighted, uh, how you say, exposed on negative, And then I brought them back to the dark room. So these are uh, manipulated images from the computer put back on negatives and then developed in the dark room on, a, on the old fashioned way. Beautiful. So those are, yeah, that, that's what brings excitement from photography to me to bring the old and the, and the new together. Thank you very much. Our next, our next artist, Clive Holden coming to you from Toronto, Canada. Uh, hi, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Chikoy, I don't know if that's how you pronounce your name, but that beautiful work. Thank you for showing it. And really well presented, too. Um, I, I also like that you mix the new and the old a lot. So um, I'm going to share my screen, of course. Uh, okay, did that work? Yes. Yes. Okay, good. Painting is dead. That's what it should say. Okay, long live painting. Uh, it's an interesting question. Uh, it's partly the history of uh, seeing really dramatic things in the art world. And some of them get remembered for a long time. And I think that part of what he was saying was that painting's role as the only way to record uh, representative, representative images uh, was over. Um, but it freed up painting on, on the other hand. Abstract painting was born and the churn that we're in now that I think of as being a positive thing in the arts with so many things going on, we really grab anything we want now to make art with that kind of came out of that moment. And uh, so it's, you know, photography is bigger than it's been ever. I mean, it's, it's, it's 100 times bigger than it was a decade ago because of social media and, and really great uh, lens, lens based uh, art making machines that are in everybody's phone. And uh, it's a pretty uh, powerful time for photography, but it's different than it was. And uh, obviously fewer people are making film-based photos, but lots still are. I still use photos. I, I, my background's in filmmaking and I use, still use uh, motion picture film in my predominantly digital work. Um, what's the equivalent now though? It's an interesting question to ask. If, you know, what, what, would, uh, what would these people say now? And they might talk about the fact that the border between still and moving images is evaporating. I think that's a really interesting thing about right now. If you, again, go to social media, you can see that people are interchanging video, very short duration videos and still images all together as if they're exactly the same. Instead, they're looking at what's in them and seeing, is this a powerful image uh, in one way or another, even if it's just to excite people for a moment or whatever it is. Um, so, Another thing is that uh, we're soon, it's starting to happen, but I mean, the large and cheap electronic display is, is going to be everywhere soon. In the next five or 10 years, there's going to be an explosion of them. the price is starting to come down now, and it's probably going to plummet over the next five years. And that's going to be a big deal for a lot of people in, this, in these uh, meetings at Expressionism. Uh, it will be partly bad. There's going to be a lot of garbage around us. It's moving and trying to cap capture our attention to sell us stuff, but it's going to be really good for us and in, in that we will be able to get some of these images that we've been making up on the wall much more easily. But uh, my primary interest in my artwork is the using code to present uh, artwork uh, live. I like to think of it as being free of duration and, uh, and uh, spatial constraints. It's infinitely um, scalable and uh, it never repeats itself the same way twice. And uh, that's uh, my work. Uh, live visual art is what I've been trying to get together. So these here are just a few still frames from my work. These are all live visual artworks that, that never repeat themselves the same way. And uh, they rely on the grid, a lot of them. 
and uh, they have a mixture of film and digital content. And the, the basis of it though, the digital basis of it though, is using custom code to create this, this live uh, mix. Uh, again, it's a kind of a churn. It's often a churn of different media and uh, that's part of the purpose. Uh, this work um, in 1000 years, the world will still be beautiful. Uh, is something I'm just finishing now in its live form. I had a video of it done earlier and uh, it's meant to be different um, like VU meters for audio, except, it, except it's processing visual images. And uh, again, it's uh, meant to show the live moment. And uh, this is a work I made called Utopia Disco about uh, 11 or 12 years ago. And it's, it's just making a point partly here that uh, you can make live media in a lot of different ways. In this case, people were invited to dance inside the eight foot by eight foot hut, surrounded by images that were live mixing and surrounded by utopian heroes of one kind or another. And, uh, and then just the most recent work I've been making is uh, this work for Kingsborough Art Museum that Tommy is helping me with uh, for next summer. And it's all live media. And that's my five minutes. Uh, thanks for hearing me and I hope you have a great evening. Thank you very much, Clive. It's really great to see your most recent, some of your most recent work. And it's really great to see you. Don't be a stranger, please come to more of these. I had an extremely busy summer with a lot of personal things going on in my family. So, but I will be, you'll see a lot more of me now. That's good news. Next up, we have Verneda Lights. Yes, uh, good evening, everybody. It's my pleasure to be here today in the midst of this uh, illustrious panel. And uh, my contribution to the discussion um, comes from the perspective of the innovation of color. And in order to discuss that, I'm going to draw on the history of photography as it was established in uh, Western cultures. The camera is 206 years old, and the first photograph uh, dates back to 196 years ago. Um, it was camera was developed by Joseph Nicephor Nipsi. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, and he's also the first photographer, according to recorded history. Um, but the camera made art a more pub public and a more mobile event, but it did not democratize it. And photography basically was born an art of the bourgeoisie. Why? Because both dark rooms and photo processing chemicals were and are expensive. Photographic setups were labor intensive and time consuming. And this is where I come in. Racial bias was baked into the science of photo development. The process of film development favored less melanated complexions. For example, the Shirley card. That was the color standard of the Kodak company, which basically um, was the behemoth that regulated how photography would be produced. And the Shirley card had white, very dark, and hardly anything in between. And the objective was to make the lighter complexions look good and everybody else was basically treated as noise. So people of color were for the most part as a major consideration in the art of photography were uh, neglected. And the Shirley card did not include um, the shades of melanin that we see with our naked eyes until 1990. So, I mean, by 1990, I was about ready to exit my medical practice and start becoming a photographer myself. But um, digital photography was an element that I believe truly democratized photography, that and the use of artistic software such as Photoshop, because it put color in the hands of individual artists and photographers. So it became the antidote to the baked in anti-melanin bias that was put into the photo industry. Now with the advent of motion pictures, digital photography and the widespread use of cell phones and home printers, we see the uh, catalyst, a catalytic effect where photography became more democratized. And these elements also accelerated the processes by which the camera became an instrument 
with which to make pictures rather than take pictures. So digital photography, cell phones, and artistic software transform the camera into a paintbrush where it became just another tool used to actualize our reality. So um, I'm going to share my screen now. Having difficulty with my screen sharing. Okay. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes. Yep. Okay. So, from my perspective, the camera is an instrument by which we make pictures. My camera is essentially my paintbrush. I started off as a painter and then um, segued into photography because I had developed responsibilities as a caregiver and I didn't have time to set up to paint anymore. So I bought a cell phone and used a cell phone camera. And this image is called Tribal Reality, and it's one of the series I titled Gullah Me, um, which is a series of self-portraits and portraits of my family members that I created while I was a caregiver because I wanted to document how we changed over time. Um, I took care of my father, my mother, and my younger brother. Um, they have all passed away. And this shows me it for the first time without these very beloved members of my family and how I saw myself as a changed individual, having segued from being the doctor with the white coat, you know, very uptight and straight and westernized into becoming more of a medicine woman and a warrior on behalf of the family. And you see we have the facial painting and the armor, the body armor. And this is the, a piece of title Falling, and it resembles vertigo um, it is my visual representation of vertigo because when you're a caregiver, you really can't um, anticipate what's going to happen. You're constantly off balance. And I use a series of photographs that were taken by NASA and the European Space Agency and the Jet Propulsion Lab to um, document the descent to Titan. And I merged it with the spiral configuration of a self-portrait here and uh, because I felt like the two went together. For me, being falling in outer space is the ultimate vertigo experience and somewhat equivalent to what you feel when you're constantly stressed by caregiving demands. And this is titled Masks Fall Away. And here I used a, a photograph of myself. I took while I was sitting at my brother's bedside and um, I had my head wrapped, and as I as I do, because that's the way of my people, this, our native dress. And um, I wanted to show the different aspects of myself that became activated. You know, you're not always one person all the time. You change according to the situation. And um, with my brother, my brother was disabled. He was mute and bed bound because of a stroke. And, and the doctors urged us to just let him die. And, my parents felt otherwise. And so as a, one member of the family who was a physician, it was my job to defend him and to be his voice. And so I have here the several, several masks where I represent myself as the African descendant of slaves, which I am as the warrior who fights and you see the blood stain on the face of the mask and as you know the physician who sees and analyzes 
and here we see the x-ray like um, portrait is sort of like a merged triptych um, and on top of it is the um, texture of fabric and for some reason I felt compelled to put that on there and um, and I'm glad I did because this was created in 2017 and uh, masks became literally uh, part of our everyday lives after 2020 so this is the spiritual mask initially manifesting as a circumstance that stimulated the artwork but then the actual mask itself became manifest in our culture and uh, it is to me that is um, synchronicity I think Jung would call it synchronicity Renata, I'm just going to remind you that it's almost time. Yep, and this is the last piece, honey. Okay. <laughs> we are closing in. This is called Tree Is Me. And it's a self-portrait I took after my mother passed away from breast cancer. I had a mammogram. And, and I wound up in the same examination room that my mother was in when um, she received her diagnosis. So, you know, it frightened me. And I could hear a voice saying, you know, don't be afraid, you're going to be fine. She had a very soft voice, very wonderful woman. And um, so I just bolstered myself up and had the procedure, and it was normal. And then I went down to the cafeteria and had a great big meal and enjoyed myself and went and sat by the river. The hospital is built on the, on the banks of a river. And um, I live in the Carolina Low Country. So I took a picture of the tree that I sat under and I took a picture of myself and it captured the sky and I uh, executed a photo montage and um, from those pictures and because I wanted my hair to be like autumn leaves and I wanted to show how I personally have become the ancestry you know and the poetry <laughs> of, of life so um, yeah, so that's me. That's my work, and that's using my camera as a paintbrush and to celebrate and depict Black people who were initially left out of the science of photography. So that's it. Nice. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing with us today, Vernada. Uh, Jaime Bautista is our next presenter. Thank you. Thank you to the team and thank you to the participants. I'm going to be as quickly as possible and have my five minutes of uh, fame, fortune, I don't know. Okay, this is my story. This is my first time participating in your team, by the way. So uh, if I, whatever I blew it, uh, I'm sorry, but my apologies. My education goes back to the, when I started uh, going to high school, I learned arts and crafts. I went to the art school. I learned to, to draw, paint, make models, and uh, face all the artistic alternatives that uh, they offer me. Then that wasn't sufficient for me. I moved to the architectural school and I finished that uh, architectural school. I became an architect. And then I started combining drawings, paintings, and photography, introducing into my architectural business. Along the way, the computers came up. And then I learned AutoCAD. Then I learned BIM. And then other software programs that uh, helped me to get through this complicated system that we are working right now. So I started with the sketches and now I'm in the AI. I don't know where the hell we are going to, but it's quite complicated and I enjoy it. I am not a professional photographer, however, during my lifetime, I use photography to incorporate in my work. Um, currently, I, my uh, daily activities are working for the government and I, 
I work as an architect. I used to work in design. Now I work in construction. So whatever I do in design, now I see the problems in construction. Now I have to blame myself for whatever I do. So which is, which is great. So that is a quick introduction of why I'm here. Uh, I'm sure you, and I hope all of you like to see my, my background, my profile, and uh, my activities in uh, Instagram. Uh, those pretty much are the thumbnails of my work that I do. Uh, I don't know if you can see the background of my, my screen. That is my city. It's called yes. Organic Mutant Architecture. And uh, those are um, drawings that I, I start with pen using pencil and paper, and then I convert into uh, a more sophisticated uh, presentation. And uh, I created about uh, probably 1,000 drawings uh, using that uh, kind of uh, style. And then I use photography to put in the background and then to make it look more realistic. Because of my experience in architecture, I, I said, you know, I don't really like to see the buildings, uh, the brick buildings. I like to see more organic buildings. And as a result of that, that that's my work. And I have um, the individual pieces that I created I combine with the drawings, I combine with, uh, with, uh, with the pictures, and I'm using the computers to modify it. And beyond that, I do not know where we are going. But for as long as um, the humans live in this planet, we innovate and we destroy things. And uh, whether it's for better or for worse, but we will keep working on this. And I'm very happy to have uh, a lot of tools in my pocket. I don't think uh, it's going to diminish the quality. All those tools that we have are quite complex to use it, but it's for our use and we will see where we go from here. At uh, this moment, I would like to see if I can share some uh, my my screen. Um, is that possible that I can do it right now? You should be able to. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Now, let's see. Um, let me see. Where, where is this? Uh, not sure. But not this one. Um, uh, do you see it? Can you see it? No. Not no. yet. Sorry. Not yet. Well, I think uh, I'm here, but I'm not. When you after you click the green share button, um, something should come up asking you what you want to share, and then you'll have to click share once more. I think it's a, a blue button for the second one where you select the window or screen. Yes, yeah, right now I'm there. I'm, I have to show everything is in Google, which I'm going to see. Hmm. Sorry, this uh, is not working. Oh, I don't understand how. No, it doesn't allow me to share. Okay, it doesn't look like I'm succeeding. I have the green button here. And uh, in the background, I have uh, my Google Chrome. Um, hmm. It's not doing it. Well, if it doesn't work, I'm going to have to show you something else. Uh, 
and it's embarrassing. Open system preferences I have over here. Hmm. Okay, does it uh, doesn't work in here. Jaime, perhaps we could move on to the next person and give you a chance to, to take a look at that. Yeah, well, uh, actually, if that doesn't work, and I don't want to take more of your time. Uh, probably, I don't know, this is one of my, can you see it, uh, what I'm showing or not? I don't think you're looking, at, I don't think so. If yeah. you turn off your background, we could probably see that better. Yeah, no. Okay, let's, you can move on. I'm going to see if I can uh, manage to, to share the screen. You can move to the next one, please, Renata. We will, and we'll come back to you later on. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next presenter is Cynthia Di Donato. Um, hello, everyone. I'm ha very happy to be here, and I very much enjoyed uh, those people who have spoken before me, uh, and I would probably say many of the things that they have already said. Um, I will, of course, say that uh, painting is not dead, and neither is photography. Um, I am uh, an analog and a digital artist, a text expressionist, of course, and um, it's important. Uh, photography is very important to my work, um, a good deal of it, in fact. Uh, what I like to photograph is the mundane, uh, very commonplace, ordinary things and uh, manipulate it to my liking. So I'll get right to uh, my work. And uh, let me begin to share. I'm using my iPad and it says it's screen mirroring, but it's still churning. I don't think it, yeah. it wants a plug in. Sorry about that. Okay, let's see. I think it's going to happen. Okay. Now I have to get rid of this. There we go. Okay, can you see my screen? Yeah, that's yes. got it. Great. Yes. Okay, um, I'll go through these. Um, here's a first image that I've taken uh, with my iPhone. By the way, that's what I use is my iPhone. And I was able to create um, this image by manipulating uh, primarily in Procreate, which is an iPad app uh, that's used by a lot of professionals. And with help of digital paint and that first image, I was able to come up with this piece called Turbulence. Uh, here's some mund a mundane photograph of uh, some rust. And uh, I use Procreate to manipulate it and create what I call my 2D sculptures. Here's another photograph of the uh, flattening of the curve during the pandemic. I cut it all up and I manipulated it. And then I eventually came up with this piece, which is going to be in a show this weekend called Space. Uh, I was at the Natural, Muse uh, Natural Museum um, in my state, and they had some uh, animal, sculpt uh, animal skulls. And I took a picture using uh, an app called Paper Camera. And from that, I created what I called Jurassic Passage. Again, this was taken into Procreate and manipulated and painted on. 
a friend sent me some computer plastic pieces he had and said, I bet you could use this. And I said, wow, thank you. Uh, began to, I photographed it and then I created by uh, layering other um, pictures and creations and created this, which is called fossilized circuitry. Uh, this is another thing I like to do is I take pictures of the television screen while I'm watching a program. And then I manipulate that. Uh, this I think I manipulated in an app called Decimate, uh, which I, I guess gives a kind of a glitch quality. And then I have a friend who has quite a collection of cameras. Uh, her father was a photographer. Uh, pretty well known. Um, and I began to take pictures. Uh, this is the bellows. I think it's that's what it's called the bellows of one of the cameras. And then I began to manipulate and blend them. And then I kept blending them and came up with this. Uh, here is dying daylilies that I took a picture of. And again, took it into several programs. I can't remember what they are now and came up with this piece. Another favorite of mine is I took a picture of the shingles on my house, which were in pretty bad shape. And I was able to create ground control by manipulating it in uh, Procreate. And also iColorama, which is another uh, app that I'm very fond of. Again, I took this same uh, shingle and added a little color. And then I continued to add color. Then I began to warp sections of it and came up with this piece. Here is some flooring. And I just was so thrilled because it's got such character. And then again, I was able to create this um, sculptural 2D piece. I also like to take pictures of fabric and I was able again to manipulate the fabric, open it up and to draw and uh, created this piece. More fabric, more manipulation of the fabric. I don't have the actual piece of the fabric right here today. And then I manipulated it again. I really enjoy taking pieces and making them into something else. So I constantly you know, reuse things. Uh, this woman was at an opening wearing this dress. I asked her permission if I could take a picture of it. And she let me do another close up. And I was able to come up with this particular piece working again in Photoshop, not Photoshop, sorry. Procreate and um, in iColorama. Uh, this is one of my failed watercolor pieces. And I was able to create this um, using, again, a number of software apps. This is a, another piece that was not a failed piece of art. Um, I decided to take a picture of that and I created uh, this piece, which I later um created this um short video that was in the Techpressionist show the virtual kunst matrix show and again that same piece that i showed you initially that i painted if i go back to to uh this one that same piece after doing that i was able to create this with it again uh this i took into icolorama and this is again the same original piece that I took into Procreate and created this uh, particular image. And then lastly, this image, which I don't have the other images that came before, the background that you see there was uh, from the Botanical Center. There were some plants there and I believe they that it wasn't a, a an aloe plant, a huge aloe plant, which I manipulated. And then I actually uh, painted in the figure that you see here. And um, this is my last piece. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Cynthia. Cynthia Beth Rubin is our next presenter. Okay, great. Um, I'm gonna jump right into screen share because I have a lot of images. Um, so I hope everybody can see this. Um, unfortunately, my somehow my screen, I'm not seeing my own words here because I have the people over at the side. I hate when that happens. But if other people can see it, I'm just gonna go ahead. So I'm interested in the whole idea of photography as a frozen moment and as a form of note taking uh, and creating relation. But as a former painter, I have to say, or as a real painter, I still am a painter. I'm just painting with photography. So for me, um, I'm kind of a fake to say I'm a photographer. I take these elements and I use them and my goal is to think about creating different levels of meaning and um, destroying, in a way, the frozen moment of photography, um, creating a, a new series of here and nows out of the, the photography. So for many, many years, I mean, people know I started before scanning, um, before when, when very basic photography came in eventually to working with the computer. And so for many years, I did these compositing, traveling, taking a lot of pictures and trying to do this, experience the moment, experience the place um, across time and place. And then I did my, you know, jumping ahead, my 40 year series where I found drawings that I had done in 1968 and went back to the same place and combined them. So I wasn't drawing on top of photographs, so I was putting photographs on top of drawings. And I took this idea to when I had an artist residency in Arl Sur Tech, where um, I really just wanted to get away and I wanted to have a free place to live in the south of France, although it wasn't like the best town in the world. Um, and so, but I had to do something related to the place. So I went out and drew with my little portable Wacom tablet every day. And then I took a picture and then I went back and combined them and did a whole series of these every day. I'm not gonna show you too many. Um, this one particular piece is interesting because at the end of my stay, the mayor asked me to do something about the Jewish history of the town and the Jewish doctors who, uh, ne nearby there was a spa, a wonderful spa town in middle ages and early, like up to the time of the expulsion. Um, and the Jewish doctors were not allowed to live in the spa town. So they lived on this street which oddly was the most preserved street in the town. Nobody had ever moved there. So I kind of tried to give this idea of past and present and painting on top of the rocks. Um, I have this whole other side of my life of cultural heritage. And I've been working on a project with Yona Vera on the Lower East Side over many years. There's an old synagogue that we've been working on. And she was really into the idea of the zodiacs. And it's like, oh, I don't care about zodiacs, but I care about the Lower East Side history. So we started doing this project where we would combine her paintings, the original iconography and photography. And we eventually decided to make an interactive web piece. Uh, this is really cool. Because it involved making little videos. And so some of these, like these are still images. We talk about making video out of still images. Really short still images, videos of still images. That's one of my favorites with morphing. And here's this. So the whole story of coming to America. Now, recently, Yona said, let's do a window installation. And the Hubble my, um, telescope images and the web images had just come out. So Zodiacs, let's work with the idea of these images. And you know, here they are, people have probably seen how wonderful they are. These images in themselves are composites of what came from Hubble and what came from Webb and their public domain. And of course, I took one and manipulated it further. And a lot of people know I've been working with plankton for a long time. This is my own plankton filming 
um, an early image with plankton that I did myself and um, just showing you one of my students how we get the plankton. This was a student off the docks um, drawing a net in. And my, this, I just decided it was a good time to make sure I don't forget the oceanographers because I couldn't work in, with plankton without the oceanographers. I'm big on showing your collaborators. So what happened is that one, an undergrad engineering student started building this incredible do-it-yourself imaging thing to collect plankton. And he did the most wonderful collecting of plankton images, which are totally useless for the scientists because they're not precise enough. It's like, not totally, I would say somewhat useless for the science, but they don't give a whole lot of precise information. But for me, they were really gorgeous. Okay. Totally differently, I started using some AI because I was doing a whole ancestors exhibition for people and I got this horrible blurry image and I took it into Gigapixel and I'm like, wow, AI is fabulous. And so I applied it to the plankton and I'm almost done. Um, and now this is not yet my finished image because I just sent it out to be printed and I'm gonna draw on it. But where I am right now is combining the satellite, the telescope images, and the plankton, and I have a couple versions going. And I feel like, you know, years ago, I never would have used anybody else's photography ever. I always had to experience myself. I never would have used something like AI. I have to do my own manipulation. Like I'm, I know Photoshop so well, I can do anything. But now I'm just past that. I just want to get the image out. So that's what I have. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cynthia. It's a real pleasure to see such recent work of yours and how it's uh, evolving. I, I like the combination of the plankton with the space image. And not done yet, it's coming. <laughs> okay. Uh, now we have a presentation by Colin Goldberg. Uh, thanks, Renata. Um, so I'm going to jump right in. Um, basically, uh, this work kind of addresses the first question about painting being dead. Um, it's uh, a series of mine that incorporates photographic elements within the context of drawing and painting. Um, and these works are technically informed by pop era artists such as Warhol and Rauschenberg, who were among the first to incorporate photo silkscreen elements into their paintings. And while these artists largely used appropriated imagery, uh, my works from this series are based on original photographs relevant to my personal experiences. So in this way, these works uh, document an autobiographical narrative. Um, in 1992, I did an internship working as a studio assistant for an artist named Steve Miller, who's on the top left. Uh, his studio is a, a renovated potato barn in Sagaponic, New York on Long Island, and it was formerly the studio of the painter Frank Stella. You can see some of the silkscreen equipment in the back. Um, so over the course of the internship, I learned screen printing from a fellow assistant, Robert Barden, who's on the top right, who printed for Warhol for many years. Um, when I returned uh, to school um, after the internship, I applied this newfound screen printing skill in an independent study and created some of my own photo silk screens in the dark room. I burned the screens um, uh, from using an enlarger and they were based on scanned pictures I took with a film camera. So this is an early one. Um, I used Photoshop, uh, early version of Photoshop to generate the half tones. And this piece is a pastel and silk screen work um, from this, this time period, 1994, based on images of the Susquehanna River. Um, here's another one from that, that time period based on uh, photos of icicles. It's a piece on canvas about four feet wide. Um, this one here is based on a photo I took of Jackson Pollock's paint splattered floorboards. And the print of this work uh, is in the, um, the permanent collection of the Pollock Krasner House in Springs. You could see some of the gestural painting done with enamel that's sort of over the top. Um, so after, after I um, finished my undergraduate studies, I moved to New York. And uh, this is a bunch of um, pieces that I created 
when I was living downtown in the East Village, uh, they were made in 1998, and they're portraits um, that are based on screen grabs from iVisit, which is one of the first desktop video conferencing programs. So these works were created in collaboration with the subjects who were individuals that I met on the platform from various countries around the world. So it's sort of anticipated a little bit um, the Texpressionism project in a way. Um, the screen grabs were vectorized and then they were completed as digital drawings in Illustrator. Um, the painting here shown on the left is entitled Pollock Studio. It was created in 2005 while I was pursuing my MFA in computer art at uh, Bowling Green State University in Ohio. And it incorporates photos I took of Pollock's studio and backyard in Springs, New York. Um, the original photos are shown to the right of the painting. And this is one of my earliest paintings incorporating digital printmaking. So the photographs were actually printed directly on top of the painted surface using a pigment-based printer before the work was stretched. And this piece was accepted into the permanent public collection of the Pollock Krasner House in 2005. And it was my first painting accepted into a public collection. Here's another work from this period, which is a laser etched wood panel with a pigment transfer. Um, the work depicts an overpass in Michigan, and the original photograph was taken with a Palm Treo smartphone in 2006. It's another uh, Michigan overpass, laser etching. After graduate school, I began refining my use of digital overprinting in combination with painting and drawing. Here's a small painting from this time period, which juxtaposes photographic, formal, and hand-painted elements. And in 2013, I was awarded a Pollock Krasner Foundation grant. Um, I used a portion of the funding to purchase this large format printer, which allowed me to work at a larger scale. Uh, so in the interest of time, I'm quickly gonna um, share a series of paintings and works on paper from this time period through the present in chronological order. So this set of four large paintings was created in the beginning of the pandemic. Um, it incorporates photos taken at one of Long Island's first drive-through COVID testing facilities. Uh, and here's an installation view of these works installed at the Museum of Contemporary Art, Long Island in 2021. My most recent work in this series are experimental plotter drawings based on photos taken in Vermont's Green Mountain National Forest, where I live with my family. Um, this is a pen and ink drawing on paper from this series. And I'm going to close with this pencil drawing on paper based on a photo taken of the same nearby wetland area. Um, I'd like to thank Tommy and Renata for organizing this salon, as well as the other presenting artists for sharing their work and all in attendance this evening. Thank you very much, Colin, for sharing your work. It looks beautiful. Um, finally, uh, sorry, not finally, I, I have a um, recorded presentation from Nina Sobel, so I'm going to share my screen. Okay. I'm not I'm not set up to sh to share it properly. Um, my apologies, Colin. Would you be able to screen it for us, please? Uh, yeah. Let me um, let me pull it up here. Oh, actually, you know what? Let me just make sure I'm sharing audio too. Okay. Okay. The Confluence of Photography with Digital Media and an Investigation into the Creative Process. I do everything on my iPhone, glitching and using apps that affect the original source photos taken. I would say that photography is not dead, but being continually modified and expanded upon. At times, the apps I use do not call for photos at all. Switching back and forth, I move forward experimentally. The following is an excerpt from the video Unseen Unheard 2020, which is also a printed edition. 
It is precisely the confluence of photography with digital media. My face mixed with my Chinese zodiac animal in preparation for a new NFT project. From photos and videos of a spider using to using AI, creating a new still to express capture, anxiety, and the fight for freedom. From stills to movement using apps and AI. to the confluence of photographic video and a new animated AI. From experimenting with Tomiko Teal's and P's augmented reality app, Arpoise, to glitching it into becoming a new graphic photo. Using an app with a spider and a veil as effects, dissolved over a photo of a glitched air vent hole. Under the veil of the sea, catch me. It's a discovered veil effect on an app. Made by using an AI app with no original source material. The end is just the beginning.
Thank you very much, Nina. And thank you for calling your quick response there. Sure thing. Um, lastly, we're going to have a presentation from my co-host, Tommy Mintz. And when Tommy's done, I'm going to ask him if he could lead you into the discussion that we're going to have. Hi, I'm going to try to, um, let's see if I can share a screen on my iPad while continuing to have audio through the screen that I'm looking at you on. So, um, Gosh, it's it's such an honor to um, can, to wrap up this discussion, and um, I have so many sort of uh, responses swimming around in my head about um, the way that uh, maybe the language of photography has come to interpermeate many directions, but also seem to have many interconnections within maybe even the sort of like outermost fringes of a direction. I'm thinking of. Um, uh, Tokoy's uh, uh, cyanotype and Van Dyke brown prints, which are sort of this, this wonderful, um, uh, really ancient process almost um, compared to the digital uh, screens that a lot of stuff is on today. Um, the language, however, that's on these screens still reflects this sort of uh, maybe uh, chemical process that um, I think we've all, uh, made part of our visual language. And, and um, I'm looking at the Jamie's, Jaime's uh, background there and the sort of similarity of line drawing, uh, AI, the sort of um, what we feed into this system and where it comes from is this uh, the, the set of techniques and, and technologies that have evolved um, together maybe. So um, I'm, I'm showing a, a little animated GIF I made uh, algorithmically of um, a series of photographs compared for difference and um, the uh, movement, um, whatever is different shows up in white. Uh, whatever is the same is, is just doesn't show up as black. So this is just a very simple Python program that um, you, you're seeing the different positions of the squeegee guy squeegeeing off a, um, the top of a, <laughs> of a, a bar on West Third Street. I'm going to, um, this is exciting. I'm glitching for a moment here. I was hoping to show you, um, Clive was mentioning this screen technology that's happening today and how um, it's becoming pervasive um, within, um, uh, uh, I don't know if I could pinch to zoom, can I? Oh, I'm sorry, people. I was hoping to pinch and zoom and show you the resolution on this enormous screen. Um, this is in Gagosian Gallery currently. This is Urs Fischer. Um, and it's a super high resolution uh, LED screen that's, gosh, you know, what's that, 15 feet tall? Somebody do it in meters for me, 24 feet wide. And it's driven by some you know, giant bank of computers behind the wall. But, you know, it really blows your mind and makes you think about it and expand like, what can we do with this visual language of photography now that it's digital, now that there's AI added to it? And Urs Fischer, um, his work is about sort of uh, cataloging and um, utilizing AI to uh, aggregate databases of images and present them. And it's, it's sort of like fascinating on many levels. So um, photography functioning in, in, in other ways. Um, um, this is Hank Willis Thomas um, also right up uh, the, the block here in, in Chelsea. Um, th these are pictures that are activated by taking a flash photo with the picture. Um, so really, once again, the language of photography being this um, structure within which we're sort of creating um, many sort of really uh, extraordinary overlapping. I'm gonna try to stop sharing as I'm talking and I know I can't do that. Um, there we go. Um, uh, interpenetrating um, visual uh, evolutions that have occurred within this very short time period of um, very rapid expansion of technology, I think is something that is hard to um, really take 
stock of until it's happened a little bit in the past. Um, but I think we're really uncovering a lot of very interesting things at this moment that AI you know, really has become our um, newest tool within this tool set of, of you know, I wanna consider myself a lens-based um, visual artist. So um, gosh, uh, Renata, did you have um, a response that you were hoping to share as well? Or um, um, oh, There's we... one thing I think, yeah, thanks for asking, Tommy. There's one thing I neglected to mention, which is that we were going to give Jaime a chance to screen share. Yes, yes. <laughs> thank you. Um, are you stopping and should I do it? Yeah, please, if, if it's working. I mean, Let me see I think it. it should work on our end here. Okay, let me see this. No, I'm sharing. I have no idea what uh, what happened with this. I don't have the sharing option. I don't have the sharing option. Uh, something maybe you have to close from your side. The green the green um, option is not longer available for me. No. Um, I I just made you a co-host. I don't know if that makes any difference. Is it is it there for you now? Uh, I don't have the the option to share it at all. The green option disappeared. The green button is not there. It's no longer there. Yeah, uh, that's fine. Yeah, there's no there is no choice for me to do it. it do you have the whole bottom menu? Yes. Yes. Yeah, the bottom. Have. I have the new I have a security, the more and leave the option, but that's as far as I go. The green option is no longer available. Is it possible that you could close some of the windows there and that maybe it's behind a window? Yeah, I have uh, minimized that one and then let me see. Yeah, I minimize that one. I have I can see everything except the green option. All right. Um, there's not much I can do, I guess. Ah, it came back. Now I have over here several options: desktop, and uh, Chrome, uh, Google Chrome. That's what I'm going to choose, Google Chrome, because that's where I have my options. Any luck? Can you see it or not? And then you, there's one more you, button. You have to, yeah, sh hit share um, at the bottom of that window once you select the Google Chrome window, and then that should bring it up, hopefully. Yeah, that's uh, sorted all there. But uh, unfortunately, share screen, desktop, open, nothing. Oh, not yet. Is there a blue share button that appears in the in, when you're given the options of what you want to share down at the bottom right? Yes, yeah, that's correct. And I said open system preferences, and the other one is cancel. So there are when I click the blue on the blue screen, it says allow Zoom to share your screen. It's open preferences, security. Oh, okay. And then that's the end of it. Yeah, probably something in your security settings is preventing you from sharing. And most likely, where do I go with security issue here? Um, yeah. Are you are you running a Mac? Yes. Yeah, I probably have to give it a system prefer, you know, permission. I see. 
Okay, to system. It looks like everything is, the preferences are okay. Yeah, something is not, I don't understand this. Uh, this uh, way is, is showing me that option that I need to open the preferences. I open the preferences and everything is okay. All right, seems like that's it. Well, if, if you go into system preferences and security, you should see there's check boxes next to different program names and you might need to put a check next to Zoom. You know, allowing it to show your screen somewhere in that depths of the system preferences. Um, it might open up to that go. spot, and then you need to scroll within a little scroll bar, mini window there. Yeah, I'm right there. Find Zoom, oh, click yeah. a checkbox, then uh -huh. say, OK, 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 a couple of times. Uh, might, have, might have to click the uh, lock to uh, make changes. Ooh, correct, right? There's a lot in the lower left that you might need to click and type in a password even. Yep. And, uh, and then click on the little box with Zoom. And I click on the little tick box with Zoom and that sort of thing you should be finding. Yeah, that's what I'm, I clicked on already. Because we just had to do this in class today. So nothing, right? And what the... I don't see any other option to click it other than the, the original video is attached. It said use elements while well, it's showing using controls, control and bytes. I think I think maybe we should move on. Sorry to say. Yeah. Okay. Seems like a no. I'm going to try again. <laughs> Okay, it's dead. No, I guess uh, you can uh, go ahead and uh, and proceed with your settings uh, with your um, your schedule. I, I, you know, your talk before that was very interesting. So thank you for that. Yeah. Yeah, um, and you're definitely you know more than welcome to to join us again. And a lot of times we do have sort of a general open share so you know um, once the um, all the screen sharing technical mm -hmm. um, issues get worked out we would love to have you back and you know yeah, we'll also um, see, see what you're working on i'll post a link to your um, site though again in the um in the chat so people can can check your work out on their own okay yeah i will share with you the link and um, the links that i have probably that might be helpful to if you if you wish to look at it other than that i guess i'm sorry about this i don't know I have to figure out what what went wrong with this uh, my system thank you very much and thank you for all the participants and um, you as an organizer as a text expression yeah. thank you thank you tommy do you want to continue So I think we firmly answered the question that photography is not dead, right? I mean, there's a silly question to propose in the first place, um, but it, it's not what it ever was historically. It's continued to evolve, right? And I think it's really interesting to sort of consider, once again, this sort of uh, interconnection between the practices we just viewed. And you know, I really think it's lovely to sort of see how the vocabulary, I'm sort of hesitating to figure out the right word of how to describe what, what it is that the, the camera has lent us as artists working within this space. Is it a, how would you describe that, Renata? What would you describe? I mean, I know you use some photographic methodologies within your brushes, but what, what does that add to your work? What would you, how would you describe that? For me, I think the photographs are kind of shorthand they they work they work almost instantly if you have the ability to take a digital photograph it's much different than waiting for it to, to develop in the dark room so they they become like a shorthand for i sometimes just take pictures to remind myself of things that i've that i want to go back to or like i i thought you showing us the big screen in the gagosian gallery 
was that you know a really good illustration of what Clive mentioned in in terms of the the ubiquity of those large format screens becoming better and better in resolution and cheaper and cheaper in price. If you want to see what's coming up in a few years, I don't want to make an advertisement because there'll be other competitors, but Samsung has a new technology called the wall. They're starting to market this year. Hmm. It's easy, easy to look up. And uh, that's probably an example of it there in Gagosian, but uh, the prices are starting to come down. They're still at uh, kind of professional level prices right now, um, but they were, you know, from a million dollars to a hundred thousand dollars. It's a big jump in a short time. In three or four years, they're come down to consumer prices, and people are going to have these in their homes. And uh, so, I don't really care so much about that. And as I said, there's going to be a negative aspect to do with the marketing, but for us. Uh, to find a way to get some of these digital images into people's homes and on the walls of, of more normal galleries, it's, it's going to be a, a huge opportunity change in a very short time. And we should be planning for it in our art practices. Uh, given what this group is interested in, it's going to be a big deal. It's very unlikely not to happen. So it's worth thinking about three, four, five years down the road, certainly 10 years down the road, probably more like five. And because uh, at a certain point, the price just starts to plummet on these things. It reminds me a little bit of when you talk about the advertising potential, it reminds me of Blade Runner. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. sure. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm, one of the things that I, I like to think about historically are the really popular uses of photography. There is this um, trend Gosh, I want to say in 1850 something with albumin prints coming out, you could make very cheap photographs, um, mount them on cardboard and people um, made pictures of themselves to leave as visiting cards. I think they were called carte de visites. Um, uh, and now we have PFPs, you know, which are these profile pictures that people use to represent themselves that maybe AI generated. You know, I think there's a lot of interesting parallels of the changes of you know, what we think about, um, we want to sort of represent ourselves as and, and how we use technology to do that. That's uh, it's kind of scary to me when we think about um, the, the introduction to Fahrenheit 451, where they have these three walls covered in screens, you know, and nothing is left on paper. Um, and here I'm just sort of musing and, and rambling a little bit, but I do think there's a really interesting moment of clarity that we have of, you know, here we're transitioning into this very screen-based representation of ideas and self, um, you know, and, and, and the lens is very much part of that translation, right? And being conscious of the distortions. Um, Renato is talking about really the you know, racial overtones of some of these distortions that the lens creates. Um, among many other concerns that we sort of really have to bring into AI. You know, um, I think as artists, we're, we're some of the uh, vanguard always into the you know, roughest sort of ideas and, and um, playing through them. So I think it's really great to sort of have this recorded and we could look back upon this sort of group of work in a few years too. Um, I, I don't want to dominate the conversation. I know that's how Zoom works. So I, I'd love to hear um, any of the participants who, who want to chime in or any listeners who haven't said anything. I see some mics are unmuted. I'm going to mute mine. So one of my observations, uh, just from the diversity of uh, the visual presentations, it almost feels like you didn't really share photography. You shared photographic technique as part of a greater sense of making imagery. So I was kind of curious as to, cause I mean, I've done that. I, you know, that, that was kind of my foray into this whole thing was starting with a camera. Um, and I, I felt intimidated by those people who were, you know, kind of classic photographers, but I liked the manipulation. I liked seeing what each one of you has done um, in stretching, um, from just like, here's an image. It's like, man, you guys all had different techniques of 
what those steps and essentially when you look at the final image a lot of these you if you didn't know you had used photography as a step you wouldn't even know that so i'm just kind of curious you know what really is photography anymore <laughs> mm. it's it's clearly merged with uh, other things you know like there's more people taking lens based images than ever before you know and and good ones you can make a decent quality photograph now with an incredibly expensive camera. I, I have an old um, Android phone, it's about four years old. It's very would be practically free now, and uh, you know it takes a really good photo, and that's that's a, a big change. Uh, Vernita, I'm also interested in what you were saying about the class aspect of the beginnings of photography, and and you know in in these we'll take these quotes big quotes come out of Paris a lot of them. And uh, you, you seem to like if you've read about that, it's interesting to compare that to today. Can you expand a bit on that? You were talking about the expense and the bourgeoisie class of being able to take a photograph. Yes, well, you know, initially you needed, in order to see a photograph, you needed a means to develop it and the chemicals in the space were just things that a poor person could not afford. Yeah. When you are struggling to feed children, you don't have, um, a room that you can dedicate specifically to something that isn't immediately bringing in money. You know, uh, you don't have the money to, instead of buy baby, baby's milk or diapers or whatever for the care of your children to uh, invest in chemicals to develop. And on top of that, um, photography was created basically to obliterate documentation of people of color, you know, to take three quarters of the planet and say, oh, they don't matter, they're just noise. We're gonna ob obliterate them and glorify and make as white as we possibly can every white person we see in the photograph. To, you know, design is strategy made visible. And I think that this is photography is an excellent example of something that has magnificent use, no doubt about it. But it was created for nefarious per, uh, ends, you know, um, to shore up the visibility of white people in the world, to secure the documentation of white Western civilization. They wouldn't come right out and say that, but that was the net effect of the decisions they made in limiting their uh, ability to capture people of color. And the fact that this problem remained until 1990. You know, Kodak used the Shirley card where they had the very dark black person and the very white white person and they skewed everything in favor of the very white white person. You know, um, that persisted until 1990 and it's, and it's awful. but. You know, technology being what it is, it's a great leveler of, of, of people, you know. Um, it's a great level leveler of uh, culture. You had the cell phones. We had these cell phones, very inexpensive cell phones, you know, um, mm -hmm. and the ability to print at home. You can manipulate your own color mixes. And I remember being so frustrated in 2002 when I had to create my own uh, color palette for people of color. I wanted to take, um, do digital paintings of my younger brothers who were fully grown at that point in time. But I wanted baby pictures of them that were in color, not black and white. And I had to create my own palette and my mm. own brushes. And I mm. thought that was just so pathetic. Um, yeah. When we have, I mean, we'd have put a man on the moon already and had international space station and all that good stuff. And we still cannot uh, rightly and accurately present to the world what we look like here on planet Earth, you know? Uh, yeah. So it is uh, distressing, the, the history of uh, photography, but I'm glad to be functioning in this space, um, you know, as a retired physician, someone who is dedicated to representing humanity and dedicated to dealing with human anatomy and which you know this 
skin is human anatomy and in all this diaspora, you know, mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's a battle. It really is um, because it is so recently that we've had this freedom. So I feel as if the vistas are wide open for me now and, and I'm able to speak without a restricted vocabulary. And I, I think it's such a crime to restri restrict, to intentionally restrict mm. on an industrial level what an entire class of people can say. You know, yeah. it's like you're silencing them. And yeah, you're you right. Yeah. To do so, you know? So mm -hmm. art has been used for nefarious purposes. But now that we have the tools that are at our disposal, we have the artificial intelligence that we can uh, feed into and correct for its inability to uh, capture faces and its inability to deal with melanin. Uh, you know, it's, it, melanin is a diff difficult molecule, but it's not impossible to render black complexions in a manner that is realistic uh, using the tools at our disposal. So I feel in many ways liberated mm -hmm. in this space and um, I feel empowered to teach and, and, and show, you know, demonstrate to those around me um, how far we need to go. Not necessarily how far we've come, but how much further we need to go. It's an important topic. There's no question about it. I, I remember thinking I was working in with video and movie film around the year the late 90s. And I began to realize that the color palettes are both are very different. They were shifting over towards video. And there was this predominant uh, brick red that was very dominant. And there was more of a fire engine red in video. Mm -hmm. It was coming not from Europe, but from Asia. Uh, the, the, le the yellows were more lemon yellow coming from the, the, the video and it was a big shift in palette and uh and but what you're talking about is is more um crucial and and affected uh, millions and millions of people and excluded them from things so it's important for people like you to be involved using these new tools it's, it's actually crucial yeah. politically crucial so speaking as a very white irish person so, uh, you know, I'm Irish I, 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 my family. It's <laughs> <laughs> well, around. They show up on DNA testing. <laughs> yeah. We no. we have uh, hands up from Patrick and also. Oh. Yeah. Oh, um, you know what? I'm sorry. I think when things went on, I lost my train of thought. How about Lee? You had your hand up. I had two responses to a couple of things I heard. Uh, first of all, Michael talking about how photography may not be photography anymore. Um, I heard that same discussion way back in the, in the late 50s, early 60s, especially as it related to Jackson Pollock, that painting wasn't painting anymore, that he wasn't painting because he didn't use a paintbrush, that he threw the paint out of the bucket. That's not painting. And it was huge international debate on that subject and it just expanded through the 60s when you got into the hippie era the hippies didn't hesitate to make paintings out of anything they could get their hands on and you got up to the light and space era in california and the plastics came in here they were using plastic not paint they were using a brush often but it didn't have paint on the end of it it had liquid plastic and the whole conversation started again about what is painting. And then to Bernada's comment, it reminds me of Nat King Cole. I'm not sure how many of you on the East Coast know this story, but Nat King Cole, a wonderful individual, um, was a very black, black man. Mm -hmm. And when he got his own TV program, it was a color program, it did not work out. He, they forced him to put white, no, not white, but light skinned makeup on so you could see his facial features because the way the system had been set up, as she's pointed out, it didn't adjust for his particular skin tone. It made him look even blacker than he already was and you couldn't see him. So a whole different technology had to be developed for television. Now, 
in relation to that, I'm originally from Australia. And the, when I would go back to Australia on visits and I would take colored slides with me, uh, there was one time that I took a roll with me that hadn't been developed. It didn't have time to develop it. Back in the 60s and 70s, colored slides were the main source of communicating in photography. So I took this undeveloped roll to Australia and I was gonna have it developed there. And they came flying out of the dark room and they said, oh, this, you brought this from America. I said, yeah, why? And they said, well, it's predominantly blue. Everything that comes out of, uh, of America that isn't developed has this overriding shade of blue in all of it, and, you know. That was the first time I had ever heard that. Now, Australia and England and probably Europe, their film thing was set up differently and, and pushed toward one color that was not blue. I was really surprised to hear that. Um, and I wonder if, if this is true with computers. Hmm. You know, when I look at images of my work on my computer and then I go look at images on my son's computer, I've noticed they don't look the same from computer to computer. So here I spend all this time trying to get just the color right on my work. Might be meaningless by the time it gets to a big wall like you showed in the gallery there. You know, by the time my work gets blown up thin, I'll have no idea what the color might be like. Well, I mean, that's that's why, uh, you know, professional displays have have their own built-in colorimeters and that sort of thing that, you know, that, that measure the color because, you know, displays are, are different, mm -hmm. you know, so it's, yeah. And the thing, the thing that's strange about this is that color is subjective in the first place. So the green that, the green that you see, isn't the green that I see, you know? And so, um, so basically it's just a matter of, you know, just seeing what the, what the wavelength profile is for, uh, a given thing and then if we want to get even crazier i say that the you know that the that the um retina display is aptly named because of the fact that it has red red green and blue dots which are designed for our cones you know i mean I, this would be totally the, our displays would be totally different if they were made for cats and of course i'm going to say cats but you know it's just uh you know it'd be more towards you know violet and uh, violet and yellow you know and so they, these, these things I find, you know, incredibly interesting. So, and then how that subjectivity of the human sensibility, you know, translates into things like race and class and nationality and all these things, you know, it's definitely interesting. I'm just getting a note. Thank you very much, Patrick and Lee. But I'm getting a note from Colin that we're kind of running late on uh, the recording. I feel like a host who's had a very successful party that's going over time. So if we could stop the recording and those who would like to stay can hang around. Thank you, Renata. Yeah, um, anyone who wants to is more than welcome to, um, to stick around um, for the after party slash advisory board meeting um, where we'll uh, make an attempt to pick a subject for the next salon. I'm also pasting into the chat, um, in case you weren't here in the beginning, three links to open calls um, through the Museum of Contemporary Art Long Island slash Patchogue Arts Council. Um, the curator there, um, Beth Giacomo, um, recently became um, listed as one of the, the artists in the Tech Expressionist Artist Index, and she has extended the deadline for these calls through October 6th. Um, so these are basically large projections, an opportunity to have your work projected on various buildings in, in the area. And, um, you know, she's excited to, uh, to, to review some submissions. So um, with that, I'd like to thank Renata and Tommy for um, moderating, for putting the, the list of artists together, curating and, you know, the group and, and uh, really, you know, developing a thought provoking presentation and also to all of the other artists um, involved in, in presenting your work. Um, and, um, you know, hope to see you all next time. Um, so without further ado, I am going to stop the recording in T minus three, two, one and cut.